Hey everyone, and welcome to Analytica's LinkedIn Live with Immediate Future. Uh, delighted to be joined by co-host uh, Katie Howell, CEO of Immediate Future, an amazing uh, B2B social media agency. Hey Katie, um, Hi. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining. And um, for the people that don't know, um, we put on an event together last Thursday uh, called B2B Social Trailblazers. So we spent so much time around each other. So we're probably sick and tired of each other, but we're going to um, put on a good show for you today. Um, and uh, for anyone uh, sort of listening live, please tell us where you're tuning in from, say hello and your location so we can say hi. Um, please do ask us lots of difficult questions. Um, uh, in this LinkedIn Live, we're gonna be sharing some uh, state of the industry research into B2B social media uh, with a focus on content creation, influence marketing, and executive and subject matter expert thought leadership. Um, but uh, but just to recap on what happened last Thursday, um, you know, Katie and I and our, our respective organizations, we brought together about 130 people in London, um, here in the UK, um, to have a whole day event focused on um, influence marketing, content creation, executive and, and, and subject matter expert thought leadership. And the whole point of the day was to bring people together to try and create engaging content as we head into what's a very, very challenging 2023. And it was a, it was a fun event, wasn't it, Katie? It was brilliant. It was brilliant. I, I think I have been skipping ever since. And, and uh, hey, Anita, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, and Anita um, from Ericsson was one of the wonderful presenters uh, at our event. And, and if you missed the event, uh, please do catch up uh, on Twitter. Yes, Twitter is still very much alive for anyone that uh, may think otherwise um, with recent news. But if you put in hashtag B2B trailblazers, um, then you'll be able to follow all of the wonderful content that was shared. And there was a very sort of active conversation on Twitter um, last Thursday and since. Um, and it spilled over into LinkedIn um, as well. So I'm going to bring up some slides uh, here and we're going to add it to the stream. So hopefully you can see um, some of the research coming up. But just to recap on, on what happened last Thursday, um, we uh, talked a lot about... Um, uh, how to create inspiring content. Anita Vesely, um, that is uh, saying hello in the comments, uh, presented Ericsson's influence marketing uh, and employee advocacy strategy. Um, there was also an amazing presentation by IBM. So Nada al um and Ryan Bars presented um, their strategy. And there was also influencer panels. Uh, there were um, executive and SME uh, panels on how to create content as, a, as an employee. Um, as an influential employee. Um, and there were also uh, other brand practitioners uh, panels on some of the challenges and how uh, we're creating content. So it was an amazing day. If you would like any of the on-demand content or the presentations from that day, please email me. Um, you should be able to see it up on screen. Uh, just email me with the subject title trailblazers uh, to tim.williams at onlithica.com. And uh, Katie and I will be sure to send you all the relevant presentations so that you don't miss any of the content that was shared um, on the day. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're just going to focus on the research here. So this was some of the insights we shared on the day, but this is really the first time that we're broadcasting this live um, in a virtual capacity. So um, Immediate Future and Onetica, we surveyed 115 uh, senior B2B social media practitioners, um, and these are the insights that we found uh, so this is hot off the press and we're going to be sharing the full published results um, in a couple of weeks um, there. So um, really what we wanted to do is to is to capture um, some of the sort of trailblazers and what the challenges are, what the sort of state of the industry is, um, and then to be able to feed you some insights. So Katie and I are going to be going through some of the, the top level stats and also share our opinions um, on how you can control um, and influence some better outcomes as we head to 2023. Fabulous. So the first question we have to ask, because we're in social, is where are you all uh, as, or, as your organisation? And everyone is on LinkedIn, as you can see, 100%. And quite a lot of you are on Twitter. So 
basically it's a crowded space and we know that it is also good to see that just over 50 percent of you in fact 56 percent of you are on facebook four in ten are on instagram and around 10 percent are actually using tiktok which shows a growth i think in the understanding that just because we work in b2b doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the broader channels which are actually getting consumer and customer attention and so that's really i'm, I'm really pleased to see that and um, um, when we look across tech buyers for instance and I, we particularly pulled out the tech buyers because a lot of our audience were from tech brands when we look at um tech buyers across the uk and the us what you see is that they spend more time on the meta channels facebook and, and uh instagram than they actually do in linkedin particularly the more senior they are so seniors don't tend to go to linkedin quite as often it's more a frequency thing than they do maybe their facebook page or their instagram face and that that presents a massive opportunity for brands for reach memorability and brand awareness um so what's really clear from this is that in order to get stand out we need to create a personality that's memorable as well as true to your brand i mean there's it still has to align to, align to your brand values there is a need for authenticity, which is, you know, the favorite word of social media, but it's that element of making your brand more human because people buy from people. Um, and then ensuring that you have consistency. What's really clear, if if, if we are 100% of B2B brands are on social pretty much every day, then you can't afford to step away from social. And I think, uh, just to add to Katie's point, um, what was very prevalent in the sort of key takeaways when we all got together last Thursday was that uh, it's really important to have a social first strategy. Yes. Um, yes. So that social is not the afterthought. Uh, number two, it's really important to bring in personal storytelling. So we would suggest that influencer-led content is the way to go there, whether it's your executive or subject matter expert, whether it's an external influencer, it's really important to get them telling the stories rather than having like a, a generic corporate narrative because there's so much content about that you're not gonna cut through. Um, and lastly, one of the big things we're seeing is uh, community. Uh, a lot of brands are trying to tap into private social communities. Um, this is something which is coming up more and more in the sort of big sort of B2B marketing conferences. Um, and also uh, we want to create our own community in terms of B2B marketers and social media professionals. So um, community is is very much you know, sort of on the rise. And um, I think people have talked about community for you know, decades, but it, just, it feels like it's more important now, wouldn't you say, uh, oh, Katie? Yeah. People yeah. just you know, speaking you know, in rhetoric. And I think that the, the key to that is also private communities smaller groups of people who can exchange real information and insight and be a little bit more open I, that's certainly something we're seeing on the on the turn on the growth um, but what is remarkable so from a corporate and brand point of view there is still elements that need to improve and in particular we have a challenge because while everybody is on their cha these channels they're treating the channels as though they were one big channel they're treating linkedin like Twitter, like Facebook, like all the, uh, the meta group. And in fact, what we see is three, only three in 10 brands are actually personalizing or tailoring content by channel. And this kind of plays into the fact that there, there are very few brands that are tailoring by specific audience psychographics of the behaviors and attitudes and values of their buyers. Um, and so I think there's, there is a, a bigger challenge to be to be had with actually getting some of the basics right. Um, we know that mindset and even trends and moments are super different on each channel. So we need relevancy if we're going to cut through all that noise and compete with all those other brands and resonate with buyers. We need relevance to make sure that each channel matches the mindset of the buyer. Um, and we need, you know, it could be like, you know, more new, I'm not saying this is the answer, but more news orientated on Twitter, but leaning into maybe learnings on LinkedIn or entertaining on Facebook, you get the, you get the principle. So, so, you know, 
it leads into what do B2B brands want to do? So we took a look at what is the core social media objective for B2B brands. And, and Katie, I've just got a question on this, so back to you. What, why do you think it's so low in the three and 10 are, are, are tailoring their content? Do you think it's, it's that they want to, but just don't have the resource or the budget? I mean, if anyone's got a, a, an opinion on that, would love to hear it in the comments. So, hi, hey, Sarah, hey, Kieran. Thanks for your comments so far. And thanks for calling out the event. Um, so it was very good to see lots of friends and uh, and peers there. Um, what, what, why, why do you think this is, um, you know, um, much lower than we would hope? Oh, I think there are three three reasons. Three is my favourite number anyway, so three but reasons. There's always three reasons, and you've got, three reasons. Ahead. you've got to make up a third one once you... Uh... <laughs> uh, the first is when I, when I started in marketing, we did not have all these channels that we have now, whether you're B2B or consumer, that we are trying to juggle a lot of work and a lot of content. And that that is then problematic when we talk about resources, which is the second challenge, is that whether it's internal or external, many, many brands are struggling to get the time and the headspace right now to go, what am I doing on this channel? What am I doing that? Taking the time to plan. And we see that later on, which is that challenge in taking the time to plan. And then you've got the final bit, which is budgets, which is a never ending problem, but is trying to create the business case that helps your leadership team understand why they need to invest in quality, better content. So it's it's too many channels, resources, budget, all the kind of usual stuff, um, yeah. plus yeah. a lot in between. Yes. Um, yeah, so some, some major challenges out there, and, and that was... Um, Really interesting to see that. So, incidentally, um, you know, Katie, I mean, you, you, you've done this research last year, and we're going to be continuing to do this research in the years to come. So, we'll be able to show you how this is trending over the over the years. Um, indeed. indeed. So, we asked them then what their objectives are, because you know, in reality, it's very difficult to tailor to work out what you're doing if you don't know where you're going. So, so what was I thought was really interesting is that that brand awareness was was front and center and that's fantastic because this means that we've got cmos looking at the long view which is part of building memorability of taking up that that mental availability in your buyer is about building brand and um you know only uh, in a, a another presentation for instance I, I think there's a nice bit of um uh, research from Eisenberg Bass that says, you know, in any one moment, only around 5% of your buyers are buying or actually buying. So when you think of it like that, then the the marketing you do today on social media has to be kind of lodged in people's brains so that when they move to the buying mode, they think of you. Um, so 71% are looking at brand 18 percent lead generation there is a, a a missed opportunity in considering social as the full fat funnel um so which is everything from awareness but also that bit of consideration the bit which supports the research side of this through to lead or demand gen and actually social will do all of those things, particularly if you're looking long term to actually begin to build a cycle of nudging and nurturing. You know how we talk about that all the time, Tim. Nudge, nurture, nudge, nurture. <laughs> um, and it's, I, th I think it's just very interesting that that from, from our perspective, we've seen the shift from just saying social is all about performance and a move towards awareness. And I should say that this is meant to be a gif and for anyone that knows katie she she gives you two things as a guarantee that that's alliteration and wonderful animal gifts um, but Streamyard <laughs> doesn't have the functionality to uh, uh to portray gifts unfortunately so um so if you want the the presentations then you can you can watch all the gifts and uh and dine out on that as much as you would like um so in terms of in terms of the state of influence marketing in B2B, uh, what was really uh, interesting is that 90% of your marketers and social media professionals uh, believe in influence marketing for B2B. Uh, Neil Schaefer was making a really uh, good point, I thought, which is you can, you can be far more effective in B2B than B2C, even though 
B2C influence marketing is what everyone has heard of, you know, the, 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 the people that everyone cites in terms of Instagram or so TikTok, you know, selling products, you know, that's where people first heard of influence marketing. But actually B2B influence marketing has been around for, um, for decades and decades. It's known as PR or analyst relations or investor relations or, or marketing. It's all part of influence marketing. Influence marketing is the buzzword, but, um, but really what we're talking about is the creator economy. So we're, we're talking about um, how influential it is to leverage content creators, whether they're internally, you're know, part of your executives or subject matter experts, or externally, uh, they could be uh, people who create YouTube videos or podcasts, uh, they could write Forbes articles, uh, turn up to events, they could do um, your know, session, um, your know, live session recordings, they can um, you know, post content on social networks like LinkedIn and Twitter and really drive engagement there. So there's all these different types of influential experts out there. And your know, B2B influence marketing uh, is arguably more influential because you can control the, the narrative better because there are fewer industry experts in the industry rather than looking at sub B2C where you're looking at millions and millions of people. Um, so I thought that was really, really compelling stat that the, the belief in the category is there, but yet 59% um, are starting or just experimenting. So there's a big challenge in the industry about how to do it well. And I think just looking into this, when you see 30 people, one could be a, a YouTuber, one could be a podcaster, one could be an event speaker or someone that wants to turn up, uh, turn up to a panel, it's very hard to work out an engagement strategy that fits everyone because they're all individuals. It's not like you treat journalists in a certain way or you treat analysts in a certain way. These are individuals that have personal preferences. And that's where it's really hard to sort of bring the industry um, together. So it's no surprise that how to achieve this uh, you know, on, a, on a scalable level um, is the challenge. Um, and But what did surprise me is that 53% of marketers have no idea or know only a few industry influences. So there's clearly some more research that can be done um, by social media professionals and marketers as to who's driving the category that they work in. Um, and then the old budget question, 50% um, of marketers have no budget assigned to influence marketing. I think that's really interesting because not, not, um, not many people have influence marketing job titles. You could be a marketing director or head of social media, and you, maybe you've got lots of budget for demand gen or for events or something like that. It doesn't have to be you know, um, allocated to the specifically the category of influence marketing. So I think, uh, I think people haven't carved out budgets, but they've carved out a lot of budgets for content creation. And there's, there's a lot of mature, maturing that I think the industry needs to go through in terms of be able to repurpose marketing budgets for generating uh, employee content, for example, or external influencer content. So uh, these stats are really um, uh, quite, um, you're good at summarizing, I think, where the industry is at. You know, there's a lot of desire, but we're really not there in terms of the practical steps of, of, uh, of running these programs just yet. So this, this slide is meant to show uh, a duck being ignored by three other ducks showing ducks bottoms at them. And I think that the reason is that um, because it doesn't build now, we can't quite see all the ducks bottoms, but, um, but it's, it's, everyone can everyone can imagine one. I, I yeah, imagine. everybody can imagine one. I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, I'm not sure I want to put that in everybody's head this afternoon, but there you go. Um, uh, and I, the reason for this is it's a perfect analogy for actually what we're doing right now, which is putting out content that is largely being ignored by our buyers. And what's what's really interesting about this is the top three challenges that that marketers have is creating engaging content getting enough quality content and getting enough variety of content. And these were the same issues in the same order that we had in 2020. So it's kind of like, mm, we haven't moved this on now. <laughs> so if you want to be a trailblazer, we need to fix this issue. We need to fix this problem um, because it, we're just going in circles. We know what the solution is. The solution is better quality, more variety, uh, deeper insightful content we just don't know how to fix it so if we slide to the next slide oh 
Sorry, I actually did get that right, but I, uh, I then went yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> um, is we need to be, as I said, we need to be relevant. And part of one of the most interesting challenges, I think, is that we might have persona data, but we don't understand our social buyer and what their motivations are on each channel and what they're looking for. What are their triggers? What are they interested in reading more about? And what are their pain points, their passion points? All of these really matter with knowing your social buyer. Yet only 13% of this the audience that responded to this survey said they put their social media audience first. And, and, and so you're already slightly hamstrung by guessing what might be interesting. And while sort of two thirds of, of respondents also ran integrated campaigns, yay, which is fabulous, that's the way it should be. Uh, what we're seeing is that content isn't being tilted. So something that's created like a broadcast video for the website or for YouTube is not being tilted and created so that it matches for social. For instance, in a typical broadcast style video that you might run at a trade event, you have the time to run a sting at the beginning, an intro at the beginning. And the, the you kind of run through that storytelling of the introduction and then the hook and then another. Hook. You have three seconds in social. You, you have to start with the hook. You can't start with all the, this is who we are and look at all our lovely branding. You have to start with the hook that is going to get attention. The second is quality content. Um, uh, and I think this is probably the easiest fix for us right now. Because 80% of those that didn't have a plan that was documented for social media tended to look at social media campaigns as an afterthought. And this is where you have the quality problem, is that you need to have a plan. You need to think ahead. You need to not suddenly put out Sears on stand 259 three days before the event. Three months before the event, you need to be building up the rationale and reasons for people to come and attend your event, download your white paper, whatever it is, whatever, wherever we're going. And the final, final element that we can see is that context is the magic source. 57% of those with a plan focus on the customer purchase triggers, the pain points, um, and most importantly, the context in which our buyers buy. You know, what is it, that scenario, whether it's the decision-making unit or whether it's the scenario of what tends to be the perfect storm that, that pushes purchase. And, and that increases relevancy too. I, I wanted to um, just ask a question from Vince, Katie, because it's in Ooh. the comments. Uh, Vince said, uh, Katie, curious how you think about driving lots of engagement, reeling the consumer in versus driving down funnel conversion purchase behavior. Excellent it's, question, Vince. It's a bit of both. So what, what we advocate is first you need a trigger. We need to grab attention first. We need to get people to notice you. So that is talking about bold, relevant content. Then we you want to develop a, a, a nudge nurture program. LinkedIn says it's, you know, it's five to nine touch points to get to get an action. That isn't even a download. That's just to get them to click on something, you know. So so what we need to do is start building our story arcs out so that they cover several different things. Could be case studies, could be talking heads, could be uh, testimonials, all sorts of different things, angles, uh, could be stats, data, analysis, all sorts of things that build out that content. And then you can look at the value exchange, which drives to lead. So it's, yes, engagement matters, but it, but audiences behave differently. So tech C-suite or the C-suite that, that buy technology very rarely comment, but they will share. So they won't, they'll, they may like, but they're more likely to share than they are to like, and they're less likely to comment. So Use engagement in a judicious way to tell you your content is resonating, but really you want to be following it all the way through the funnel, looking at site size drives, uh, dwell time, and of course downloads if you're if you're doing data capture at another end. The, 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 it, it is about using marketing to build the relationship to keep going with the story, and that's really where the value of social sits. Uh, and Katie ran a fantastic workshop last Thursday to talk about how to create nudge nurture content. So if you want uh, any more advice on that, then be sure to uh, to get in touch with Katie. 
um, on LinkedIn. Um, here's one of your your really yeah. cool frameworks. I wanted to, yeah, so I wanted to share this with you because that, actually this plays into what Vince asked. Um, which is which is how you know wh where are we with the funnel? The, the real g genuine juiciness of um, social is in measuring beyond the vanity metrics. So vanity metrics serve their purpose; they're extraordinarily valuable in getting you to understand how your content performs, what's interesting to your audience. You can you can do some research and insight, but ultimately you want to test and learn what's working now. But actually following your, your social activity through uh, your website um, um, through to conversion. So what's, what's happening and then what business value that is. So the, the business value could be MQLs, SQLs. But, but if you start to follow that story through, what happens with your testing and learning is that you understand that you may have very low engagement on a post, but it's driving a lot of visits to your website are driving a lot of downloads. So it stops you making false kind of assumptions. So it's really important as you go through this that those with a plan that looks at this more full funnel element are able to get to that place of talking about value to the business. Yeah, so I think that's a fantastic framework to, um, to follow. And if you want uh, copies of it, then obviously... Um, get in touch, and I'm sure Katie will will ping it over to you uh, in uh, in yep. more practical format, so you can work on it internally. Yeah, absolutely. We have a big master measurement framework that is a very large spreadsheet. <laughs> um, but this this is the last bit from me, which is really talking about passing the pigeon test. So when I was doing this, you can tell I got mildly obsessed with the theme of birds. Um, but along the way, I found out that pigeons are I hate pigeons, but anyway, but uh, pigeons are really, really intelligent. Apparently, they can recognize each letter of the human alphabet. They can differentiate between photographs and they can even distinguish between different humans within a photograph. So that, you know, what they, they're able to say. So I said, what, what they're able to see and do is quite interesting because they're able to see the differences. And this is why we need to make sure we pass the pigeon test because so much of what we put out in B2B looks the same. Uh, an example is, is, is I did a collection about a year ago of cloud computing brands and the visuals they put out and all of them had a cloud in and nearly all of them were blue. Differentiating them was almost impossible. And I, so I think it, it's about having frameworks in place that help you understand the formats across different platforms, the behaviors by channels that give you clarity on how to shatter your creatives and change gears on copy between channels and, and helps you to filter through the evergreen content, the content for wider campaigns, the rework content, so that you can create a wider array that can be differentiated by a pigeon. Um. And that's a fantastic analogy. So uh, I hope that everyone adopts that past the bidding <laughs> test um, you know, globally. Um, Hannah, you've got a, a great question. When you talk about influencers within social in terms of who is most active within the space you operate in, how do you recommend large corporations um, who, who operate in a vast range of industries and operate as a parent company to lots of smaller entities uh, tackle this challenge? Uh, th this is a great question. It's obviously... Uh, multifaceted. Um, the best way I can answer to, uh, this is that it's really important to map out your your influencer ecosystem. There'll be influencers that um, who are influential across horizontal thought leadership themes, and there'll be influencers who are influential in the automotive industry, or in healthcare, or in finance, or tech, for example. Um, so it's really important to do that. Uh, if you're a global organization, you can obviously do that by regions or different business units. Um, and then um, there's a listening exercise. So to be able to subtract them on social to understand what's really important for them, a bit like what Katie was saying, you know, what's important to the audience first, you want to see what's driving the most amount of conversations from the influence community. You then want to look at the, at the search demand um, you know, in, in Google or, or YouTube or um, your other search engines out there. Um, you know, TikTok, for example, you could also look at um, your customer 
uh, pain points or challenges and what really is driving innovation with the industry. Uh, and then you can settle on, on a few topics where you can find influencers who are great content creators. Um, it, but it just depends what you want to achieve. You know, it could be that you want to, uh, in a small entity, just drive some registrations to an event. And so that would be something that could be localized um, and could be, um, you're know, specializing in a certain topic. Or you might want to achieve sort of global awareness on a particular sort of topic, um, you know, which could be a horizontal theme. Um, so it just it just depends upon the um, the campaign objective. Um, but what I would say is that it's important to pick areas that might be underperforming or where there's the greatest upside, um, because it's a really innovative go to market strategy, which is very, very powerful when you get it right. And when you create all this compelling content, um, it's really great to be able to measure the uplift on how well that's performed against your previous uh, campaigns um, or content creation that you've uh, that you've gone about. So there's no one answer, but I think you're mapping out the influence community and really categorizing them um, you know, by smaller entity, but also uh, globally. It just depends, you know, obviously, which parent company you're talking about. Um, you may help you um, uh, achieve some good results there. So hopefully that was useful um, for you, Hannah. Just moving on to the next slide. Obviously, let me know if you have a follow-up question on there. Um, part of the emerging trends on the research, so um, Katie's pulled out quite a lot of the stats, um, but what was really interesting is that 30% of the respondents uh, put employee branding as one of their top three objectives from social media. And this is something that we talked a lot about as a community last Thursday, and it's something that employee retention and branding is really on the rise. So it's really one to, to watch out for. The other trend, which I think everyone feels in B2B, but might not be acting upon it, is the rise of TikTok. So 10% of brands that we surveyed are creating content on TikTok. Uh, and we talked a bit about um, you know, uh, creating content on TikTok. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to you know, post that on, uh, on TikTok. It could be posted on LinkedIn, for example, or other channels. Um, but clearly, um, you know, it's a it's really big um, you know, social media um, network for consumption of content and you're uh, going to be really important for B2B, I think, in the coming years. We also touched upon how a lot of people are feeling. So this is this is not part of the research, but actually someone, um, well, actually, uh, you can see on screen, Caitlin Smith from Bottom Line Technologies, she, um, she was happy for me to include her quote uh, in on this. Just message me and you can obviously read uh, what she's saying, but she's, she's, she's basically... Um, summarizing that she's a one-person team and there's you know, strategy formation, content creation, coordinating with many different lines of business, lots of, of reporting, the physical posting, launching employee advocacy programs, influence marketing programs, you're all for one person. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure on social media professionals and um, and uh, you know we, we recognize that 2023 leading into a very likely uh, global recession, there's going to be more pressure on budgets, there's going to be um, fewer resources in some companies, and we've really got a challenge on our hands to be able to build the business case for social media and to connect social media to business outcomes for senior management. So this was just a slide to, to empathize with a lot of people out there that are feeling the strain um, and that we know it's going to be a challenging year, which is why it's really important to, to cut through with your content and focus on quality. So what can what can you control directly? I, I'm a big fan of... of you know, rather than you know feeling weighed under all the pressures to be able to sort of take control ourselves and there's things that you can directly control and there's things that you can influence so what was really fascinating is that um, only 12 percent of uh, survey respondents uh, had a well-documented strategy that got senior management buy-in and 13 percent of respondents had no written down social media strategy. So first things first, there are a lot of people, like Katie was saying at the beginning, who are just not writing down their strategy and not making it audience first. And that is one thing that you can immediately change um, just by investing the time um, to be able to do that. Um, we talked about focusing on audience, um, engaging stakeholders to get buy-in. You know, I've been part of you know, PR measurement uh, industries for um, for a number of years, like previous to when I was in influence marketing, and you know these industries had to do had to work very very hard at going around senior management to persuade people the value 
of PR, the value of social media, the value of influencer marketing, you know, why you should create content with employees or external influencers. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon us as social media marketers to take the lead here and to start engaging senior management, to start asking what's really important to them, start connecting up the dots um, and really getting them to be pioneers of your strategy so that you can get your senior management buy-in, which obviously unlocks more budget and just connects these strategies um, far better together. So we have to be better communicators. Um, we can't talk in likes or comments at board level. Um, obviously, everyone recognizes that, but I see time and time again that there's just more that can be done there. I'd love to get your thoughts, Katie, on on a few tips that you think social media professionals should should do better to get the sort of boardroom buy-in. Yeah, I think it is about considering where social contributes to the value of the business, whether that's the obvious, where's the ROI in, in, in demand gen or awareness, because reach really matters. Things like that are used in consumer, like brand equity points, or, or actually looking at where there are even more benefits around talent acquisition, retention, all the things that people are worrying about when we're trying to keep the right skill sets on board with our businesses. Yeah, and and in and I think that's that's absolutely right to focus on on those areas. And if you add in the fact that what gets senior management most interested when you talk about what competitors are doing that you're not doing, that that is an emotional trigger for senior management to get bought into this. So it shouldn't necessarily be the main reason, but if you're trying to get attention. Uh, and you're sort of working you know, up the chain in terms of the organization, find something that your competitors are doing better than you and mm -hmm. highlight that and, and say what you want to achieve because you know, that tends to get some really good results um, just psychologically. Um, the other part is what can you influence? And so um, really, I think uh, one of the things that um, I talked about actually with Sarah Goodall, the CEO of Tribal, uh, if you're still listening, Sarah, is, is the change in mindset towards content creation. You know, how can you repurpose marketing budgets uh, towards um, enabling employees to generate more content? How can you invest in employees to be better storytellers? These are changes in mindset um, from how we normally um, try to sort of create content internally. Um, so I think that's, that's one. We talked about connecting social strategy to business outcomes. Uh, raising the qualifying bar for acceptable content obviously a lot of social teams you know, ping back uh, content internally and say that that's not you know fit for purpose for social anita uh, vaselli talks a lot about that from ericsson about the social first um, mentality and having quali qualifying criteria for social content it obviously takes a bold strategy but we need to uh, to be brave and bold as we head into 2023 um, and the other part is just encouraging investment into personal storytelling it's all about relationships and community um, and, and that's really really important um, to be able to sort of cut through all of the noise out there um, it's important to measure your know, campaign buzz and, and how much initial awareness and impressions and engagement. Obviously, that's really important to make a big splash, um, but then it needs to be connected in terms of what Katie was saying, this sort of full fat funnel um, to be able to see how you're driving engagement and then driving sort of demand gen and awareness um, on an ongoing basis. So, um, so you'll have obviously CRM data, so sort of sales um, data that, that's available. You'll have this of social metrics. Um, then there's be some site traffic content. And sometimes it's about trying to find 20 data points and connecting them up or just doing a better job than you would have done uh, previously. Uh, getting curious about the data and just trying to measure as much as possible. There's, of course, going to be some dark social, you know, social conversations that you can't measure, uh, which is important. And, you know, how social networks actually um, connect to the C-suite. That you know, There's some dark social conversations out there. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that you can measure. So I think to just have a curiosity and a desire for measurement is really, really important. So um, that's the end of our research here. I put in the chat, in the comments, um, a link if you want to register your interest to receive the full published survey. And um, this is going to be out in the next couple of weeks. Um, any other advice, Katie, for, uh, for our wonderful community of social media practitioners? Um
don't despair. <laughs> social media is a journey <laughs> would be number one. Number two is that after working in social media for 20 years, we're kind of kind of quite used to helping uh, brands create the business case for their C-suite. So if anybody wants a bit of help on how they can create that business case, um, just DM me. Uh, we, we, we all invest the time because we're used to doing it. So to, to, to give you the business case and some of the data that will help you to persuade people that you need support and help, more resource and more investment. Great. Well, on that on that note, um, you know, wishing you all the best for your for your planning. I know a lot of people are in planning mode for 2023. Um, I hope you uh, get all of the approvals for what you uh, would like to achieve. And yeah, if you if you want to continue the conversation, then Katie and I are um, available at any time to speak. And um, we've also set up a guild community. So uh, if you look at uh, Guild, it's a private social media community app. Um, you can download it and there's a group there called B2B um, Influencer Marketing Trailblazers. Um, feel free to, to join that. We're going to be sharing presentations, education, insights on just to help the category move forwards uh, as we move um, into 2023 in the coming weeks. So, um, so best of luck to everyone and um, thanks, Katie, for, oh, thanks uh, for having me. me. It's great to talk about this again and um, we'll speak soon.